My name is Farhan Umedali. I'm a documentary filmmaker and educator. My focus is the environment, sustainability, and conservation. So I happen to live in the city of North Vancouver, and I'm also a constituent of Jonathan Wilkinson, who happens to be the Minister for Fisheries and Oceans, as well as the Canadian Coast Guard. So I walked into his election office because we're just a couple of weeks away from a Canadian federal election, and I asked him, if I could interview him in an uncut interview that we would release to the public about Canada's climate commitments, our oceans, conservation, and some of our controversial pipeline decisions. So here's that interview, and I hope you enjoy it. Thanks for taking the time to meet me. Not at all, thank yeah. you. As you know, I'm a filmmaker. Um, I'm focused on the environment, sustainability, and I live in Lower Lonsdale, which is part of North Vancouver. You are the Minister of Fisheries and Oceans as well as Coast Guard. And um, you agreed to take this meeting. You allowed me to ask you anything I want to. And I really appreciate that. That's not um, something I was expecting. And um, I just wanted to ask you firstly, how did you get into politics? Can you give me a little bit about your background and how we ended up where we are today with you being in charge of the largest coastline on planet Earth, being responsible for the Arctic, being responsible for so much? I mean. Our ocean is, is, is actually the pride of Canada, I'd say, like surrounded by ocean. So how did you get here? Well, I, uh, I made the decision to enter politics in 2015. Um, before politics, I was a CEO and a, and a senior executive in the clean tech space in, in uh, BC. So I ran companies uh, that uh, focused on things like renewable energy, uh, making uh, industrial processes more efficient. I ran a company that dealt with water and uh, remediating water from mine sites. And so, uh, so I was pretty happy doing that. I mean, I was always one of those folks who, uh, who was in private enterprise, but I, I always was attracted to enterprises where there was some social purpose to the work that was being done, and certainly clean tech there is. I got into this in 2015 in large measure because I was concerned about climate change. Um, having worked on it for many, the good, best part of 15 years, um, I was really worried about where we were heading uh, under Mr. Harper and Prime Minister Harper, uh, both in terms of not just not doing anything uh, in terms of addressing the climate issue, but also not being part of the conversation internationally. And uh, and I uh, I talked a lot about it. And my friends finally said to me, "Well, if you're if you want to talk about it so much, <laughs> are you are you willing to do something?" And so yeah. that's how I ended up getting into politics. So in a sense, um, it's interesting because that Harper time actually shifted my career away from mostly focusing on promotional uh, videos, marketing videos, into let's become a documentary filmmaker and help occupy an island to stop LNG. Um, Harper really scared me. Um, we had eight years of Harper, where conservative government had prevented even scientists from being able to con contact the media. We were pretty much left in the dark with regards to where we stood with climate change while the government was really focused on you know, dinosaur fuel, uh, trying to build pipelines through indigenous land without consent, just bulldozing. How have you managed, and I mean, Canada has put, put its foot down, really. But I think last, the last election was a lot of strategic voting because of our first past the post system now. In the eight years of Harper, where, where did we come from and what have we been able to change? Where do we stand today with regards to the oceans, climate change? Well, I think one of the things that bothered a lot of people, um, not on a partisan basis, but what bothered a lot of people about the Harper government was the lack of respect for science and for data. And, and I think the thing that pe most people remember is the scrapping of the long-form census, which made no sense. You know, I mean, municipalities use the data out of the long-form census to help them figure out where to put different kinds of services within communities. It made no sense, other than the fact that that government was intent on trying to remove information on which you could actually make good public policy, so you could make decisions just based on ideology. What was a long-form census? So the long-form census was something that everybody was required to fill out, that essentially gathered information from around Canada that allowed Statistics Canada to look at where things were growing, where poverty existed, and municipalities in particular, governments and, and social scientists used it a lot to help inform discussions about, about public policy, but municipalities used it very much to make decisions about areas where they would build recreation centers and, and a range of things. Um, the Harper government eliminated that, and it was part of a campaign where they eliminated all kinds of scientific approaches. So 
within the department that I'm responsible for at the present time, fisheries and oceans, there were hundreds of millions of dollars that were cut out of science. Um, and, and just, you know, they got rid of the bulk of the marine mammal research group in the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, so we didn't really have the capacity to look at what was happening with southern resident killer whales. It made no sense, and, and I'm not saying that as a partisan thing, it's just if you were going to make good public policy, you need information. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people were upset about that, the people who, who from all political stripes and, uh, and many people who are of no political stripe, and they just felt like we needed to do something about that. And so... That one was of the, like one of the things he did right away, is, isn't that right? I remember that being early on. Right. So one yeah. of the, I mean, one of the things we committed to was to actually make investments in science, to mm -hmm. unmuzzle scientists, to let them actually say the things that they're working on and to have that debate in the public sphere. Mm -hmm. And one of the very first things we did is we restored the long form census and we've made significant investments in science, uh, in, in scientists and capacity to do science. Certainly in my department, we've made a lot of investments in that. In Environment and Climate Change Canada, we've made a lot of investments in that. And that's just, just to enable us to make thoughtful and good decisions. Yeah. Now, when we're talking about muzzling scientists, that seems to have kind of blown over now. But I remember that as being a really scary time where a uh, government scientist with data about climate change, real data about the impacts of you know, what's happening with our world, with our environment, with nature, they weren't even allowed to talk to the media to put that, those messages out there. They weren't even allowed to have a voice. Yeah. And they would lose their job if they spoke directly with the media, they had to have a, a media relations officer, part of the federal government, vet the questions from the media. Yep. Some wouldn't even get back to the scientists. They would change the answers of the scientists to make it more, uh, would, so it, was, it had a political influence. And I think they weren't even allowed to mention the words climate change. Is that period. true? There was a period where uh, scientists, I think, were very, very uncomfortable saying anything yeah. because they, they would face consequences. I mean, I don't know if you recall, but there were, there were protests of scientists in many cities, certainly in Ottawa, mm -hmm. where they came into the streets to actually protest the way in which they were being treated by the government. I mean, I don't, I don't know how often you've ever heard scientists go into the streets to actually campaign. It's pretty unusual. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it reflected the fact that people were very uncomfortable with that, the, the previous government's approach to science. I think we now have a situation where scientists feel and should feel comfortable bringing forward their results and their data. Certainly within my department, there's a robust discussion on many issues about scientific um, direction. And that's part of the scientific process is to actually have those kinds of debates so that you can figure out why you disagree and where you disagree. And you can hopefully move to a point where you can find common ground. And do you think part of the muzzling of scientists, and sorry to harp on that, um, do you think that was part of a two-pronged strategy to really, so that we could push through as many pipelines as possible and really ignore our climate, uh, ignore climate uh, at all, like the Paris Accord or anything like that? Is that because we needed to make sure that our scientists weren't able to have a voice so that we could do, people would be, remain in the dark? Is that part of that or not? Well, I mean, I, I, I'm speculating, but, but I certainly I think that most people would say eliminating science um, and the, the data on which you really need to answer questions around things like major projects and those kinds of things. I mean, it's hard to understand why you would get rid of that other than that sometimes when you don't have the data, it's easy to make certain kinds of decisions. Mm -hmm. um, I would tell you that, that most thoughtful Canadians, even most thoughtful conservatives, wouldn't think that that was a wise course of behavior. It's just, it's not partisan, it's just smart to have data. And we, in our personal lives, we, we use information to make decisions. We typically don't make decisions without having some basis on which to make them. That's just smart. We were actually having to argue the benefits of science in the first place, which is a scary place for a modern yeah. society, right? I mean, science is not a matter of uh, opinion, right? It's actually like, we're trying to get to facts yep. to make real decisions that benefit Canada and the world. For sure. And, and when there yeah. is debate between scientists, that's actually a good thing as part of the process. But mm -hmm. you're heading towards, ideally, some kind of agreement as you figure out some of the things that are still remain questions. Yeah. It's a scientific process, for sure. Was uh, climate change, uh, is climate change up for debate? <laughs> is this I still think, something I mean, real? Because it was, it was four years ago. Right. It was four years ago. Yeah. And you look at you know, uh, Greta Thunberg saying, how dare you to our world leaders? I think of Harper's leadership there, very immediately muzzling scientists. And he didn't believe in climate change. And yeah. I think a lot of the people that are in place in the Conservative Party today, 
the ones that had wanted that basically got them had the Muslim, uh, you know, the the, the uh, what is it, the Co barbaric culture. cultural practices. All of these yeah. same people are still are still running the show today, and they don't really believe in science. Yeah, and and I don't think that's everybody. I mean, there are some in the conservative caucus, like Michael Chong, who mm -hmm. uh, who is a believer in climate change and has advocated for some action on climate change, but. Absolutely. I mean, if you look at a number of the members of parliament in the Conservative caucus, there's certainly a question as to whether they even believe it's real. I mean, look, Maxime Bernier, who came within 1% of winning the leadership of the Conservative Party, says wow. very publicly that he doesn't believe climate change is caused by human beings, that it's not a big deal, it's mm -hmm. not a problem. He would do nothing about it if he was elected. So, yeah, I think that's a problem. But I would say to you, there is a very broad consensus, I think, politically in Canada amongst Canadians and amongst most of the political parties, that climate change is a huge issue and it's one that we need to address. And certainly from a scientific perspective, there's no debate. I mean, there are a few people way out on the fringes yeah. that, that may argue, but I mean, 99.9% .9 of scientists yeah. agree that, that climate change is a real problem and that man is causing a significant portion of it. So, I mean, I know, like I used to work in environmental assessments, right? Yeah. Um, I was watching Canada's environmental regulations completely obliterated during Harper time. What have we been, em what, where were we at then? And where are we at now? Have you managed to make any change there uh, with regards to even protection of our oceans? Yeah, for sure. I mean, part of the first four years and, you know, I mean, part of the challenge with democratic systems is four years is a very short period of time. Right. But, but is trying to restore uh, a number of the different protections that were lost under the Harper government to improve the processes that they changed. So for example, they very much changed the environmental assessment process in 2012. We went through three years of working with Canadians, consulting with Canadians to develop a new system, one that makes sure that we're engaging First Nations far earlier in the process to ensure that we're framing the process on a go-forward basis. But that took most of the mandate to do that. We uh, have developed a new Fisheries Act, which restored all of the lost protections for fish and fish habitat that were taken out when the Harper uh, Group uh, gutted the Fisheries Act in 2012. Right. Um, you know, we've put in place a whole range of protections under the Oceans Protection Plan. Some of it relates to ensuring that we've got search and rescue capability and, and uh, environmental response capability. Um, but it also is, is part of around partnerships with uh, Indigenous peoples in terms of how we actually ensure we're going to be managing our oceans thoughtfully going forward, how we protect the southern resident killer whales. I, I, would, I would make the argument that we've done a lot to restore some of the damage that was done by Harper, but mm -hmm. there's a lot more work to be done. And, and we shouldn't be aiming just to restore what, what Harper took apart. We should be looking to try to find ways to advance and make Canada world leader in protection. Absolutely. I mean, we had the National Energy Board sort of given superpowers without even holding public consultations and then really trying to force through uh, projects like Kinder Morgan. And I think one of the things was we came out of such a dark time with Harper, where Canada really didn't care about the environment you know, really didn't care about indigenous yeah. people. I think there were just obstacles in the way, kind of leading on this colonial legacy of oppressing them, you know, and it was a very, and Trudeau and your government promised us nation to nation relationships. So the hopes were so high. Yeah. And then right off of the bat, we see Petronas LNG, green lit, and that was, you know, a $36 billion project that would make, you know, a plethora of carbon emissions, make our carb, it made it, it made it look like, how could we meet our climate targets when we're, we're really focusing on building these pipelines for like LNG? Like how, where do you stand with that? And how, does, how do those projects get approved when they're sitting at you know, the mouth of the Skeena River, a vital salmon habitat? So, I mean, the, the two big issues with that particular project obviously were the potential for impact on salmon habitat, especially juvenile salmon habitat. Mm -hmm. And the other was the GHG impact, there's no question. Yeah, that's 360 million metric tons. Yeah. It was a, a, and it was a big plant and, and the emissions associated with, were very large. And so in working through the, the, uh, the assessment, we certainly on the salmon habitat side, I wasn't the minister at that point, but working through that, the, the fishery scientists had to develop an approach and require the company to go through an approach that would significantly minimize any potential impacts. And I think you were quite well aware of a lot of the things that the proponent was going to be required to do around building a huge bridge out beyond yeah. the eelgrass beds and mm -hmm. all those kinds of things. Uh, on the emissions thing, I mean, I think the reality is, um, 
any of these kinds of projects has to fit into the envelope of emissions that Canada is committed to its international partners to do. Mm -hmm. And British Columbia has its own plan, and so any of these uh, these uh, projects would have to fit into that um, that kind of an envelope. I think the reality is, if the Petronas project had gone ahead, that it would have been very difficult to fit any other LNG projects under the envelope if they did not do one of two things. There's only really two ways for large emitters like that um, to kind of fit in an overall climate plan. One is that you end up fully electrifying the way in which they liquefy natural gas. Right, if you do that, right. the emissions go way, way, way down. That's very energy intensive. Yeah, right? that's yeah. that's the most, that's where the GHG emissions come from, is when you use natural gas, you burn natural gas yeah. to liquefy. And again, so for people who don't know that, so you're actually taking a portion of the, the gas, yep. And actually burning that in a turbine to generate electricity yes. to recompress the same gas. To essentially liquefy it or yeah. drop the temperature and, and, and compress it. Yes. Right, exactly. Um, and, and that's where the, most of the emissions come from. And so, mm -hmm. you know, beyond Petronas, in order to actually make it viable to have another plant and still be able to meet your emissions targets, mm -hmm. you would have had to look at full electrification. And there are companies like, like Chevron that are looking at, you know, full electrification mm -hmm. if they were to build another LNG plant. Right. The other is, you know, under the Paris Agreement, there's what's called Article 6, where yeah. if you can tie the emissions, so you take LNG and you port them over to, let's say, China, and they shut down a coal plant, and so the overall emissions are reduced, right. there is a, a mechanism in the Paris Agreement where Canada could take credit for part of those emissions and, and so find a way to reduce the emissions that way. Right. Article 6 hasn't been fully worked out yet, so that's probably not a short-term answer and yes. you would have to tie it directly, directly to the emissions reduction in the other country. But I would just say to you, um, the, uh, the Petronas uh, plant, had it gone ahead, would have fit within the overall envelope, but it would have been very challenging to do anything other than the Petronas plant. Understood. But then what about, you know, you're looking at uh, all of this, you know, if you consider the health of that ecosystem, when, you know, leading scientists like uh, Jonathan Moore from SFU are saying, this is uh, uh, going to destroy our salmon resource in the Skeena River that thousands upon thousands of indigenous people depend on. How can we rationalize it at all? And it's being built on indigenous land, like unceded indigenous land, which we have to, you know, we can be dealing with elected, you know, ban mayors, right? When yeah. Part of that's a, that's a colonial structure of governance for indigenous people just to manage the reserves. Yeah. You know, the indigenous leaders all up the Skeena River had said, have signed a Lilu declaration saying, we cannot have development at the mouth of the Skeena. Why, why, why do we even, how can we even consider these projects when we want nation to nation relationships? And that's what I was kind of asking about before. Yeah. I know it's a hard question. Yeah, I mean, I th look, the way that we have done these projects in the past, as, as you will know, the Petronas project started many years ago, yeah. um, and it started under the old uh, environmental assessment process. I mean, I think the, the way you get ahead of these kinds of conflicts is you change the way in which the process works. So first and foremost, you do things like what we've been doing, which is creating marine protected spaces in areas of high biological diversity, which essentially mean then you can't have industrial activities within them. So mm -hmm. identify those areas that really are worth protecting right. and then put in place those kinds of protections early on. And I think you may or may not be aware, but when we came to power, 1% of Canada's marine areas were protected. Now, now there's 15, almost 15%, 14.3% are protected. Um, and we just announced, uh, or today, the Prime Minister announced that we will do 25% by 2025 and 30% by 2030. Yeah. That means that you're really looking at the areas of high biological diversity where there's okay. something that you should be protecting and putting in place measures to ensure that you, you've dealt with that yeah. up front. Um, I think the other piece is we do need to engage Indigenous communities much earlier in the process with respect to environmental assessments, and that's exactly what the new environmental assessment process will do. Mm -hmm. So that some of the real concerns that people may have with a particular project are surfaced very early on, and there's a conversation about how could you address those concerns, or can they be addressed? I think one of the major concerns is, is not, it's, it's um, when you look at, you know, First Nations or Indigenous people, the government doesn't know who to talk to. Yep. And it's really the hereditary leadership that is responsible for their, you know, the survival of their people since time yep. began and the future. It's a, so when we're talking about, you know, as you mentioned before, you know, four year election cycle, you've got eight years of Harper gutting our, in, our environmental regulations, trying to turn Canada into a petro state. Now you've got four years to, to make a stand.
And then now, you know, because of our election system, first past the post, we don't want to teeter between four, you know, four years of progress yep. and then four years of backwards, yep. four years of progress, four years of backwards. When you're looking at indigenous people, they're thinking about the future of their, you know, of our planet, yep. their shared world. Yep. And it's many generations of, of responsibility that they have. How do we get around that? How do we get around this? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a hard one, right? Um, mm -hmm. I do think that uh, somehow we need to have a longer term view than f four years. Four years is not enough time. I mean, when you're thinking about addressing climate change, that's a multi-decade process that we need to go through. It's right. not something you're going to solve in four years. You need to start, right. you need to take measures, but mm -hmm. you're not going to solve it in four years. Right. And so you don't want your political leaders to, to be thinking in such short increments, and you certainly don't want them to be flip-flopping back and forth between one who believes in climate change and wants to do something and another one who really doesn't care. Yeah. Um, on the climate issue in particular, I mean, my hope would be that you make this a nonpartisan issue, that everybody agrees that you must do something, that you must do something aggressively. Maybe right. we have different ideas about how to do it, but, mm -hmm. but I'd like to get to the point where we're not arguing about whether we should be acting. Yeah. But, but I think that it's incumbent on, on us, uh, certainly we, we have been the government if we're reelected, it's incumbent on us to, to try to start taking the longer term view, to try to at least make that something that, that is expected of political parties. We, yeah. we did that a little bit in the first term. So the national housing strategy is a 10 year program. Yeah. It, the transportation commitments we made to, to TransLink and to other municipalities are 10 year programs. Right. So that people can plan. Yeah. But I do think we, we need to take that thinking into other areas. And in areas like climate change, it needs to be far longer than 10 years. It needs to be 20 and 30 and 40 years. Yeah. I think we, we don't want to become the United States where, you know, it's so partisan that people are willing to stand behind leaders right. like Donald Trump that are, you know, colluding with other countries and doing all these things there, we have to stand up for the interests of our shared world and, and our, but, but it seems really difficult with four years. So how do we, you know? Well, I guess I, I, there's probably two pieces to that. One is, you know, model behavior. So whoever is elected in this election hopefully will model behavior, which is a longer term perspective. But it's also that, that people have to start demanding that of their political leaders. I mean, at the end of the day, political leaders will respond to the demands of we the demanded population. Harper. We demanded Harper. <laughs> okay, we were, we were in the streets, okay? Yeah. Uh, screaming and shouting. We shut down downtown so many times. Where are we at with Andrew Scheer? Well, I think that, you know, Andrew Scheer is, is not much different from Stephen Harper. Um, he was there during the Harper period. Um, he, uh, he has the same caucus. I mean, look, even the candidates that are, are not sitting members for the Conservative Party, many of them were Harper candidates in right. 2015, including, you know, Mr. Saxton here in this riding. Right. Um, so uh, I, I would uh, say to, uh, to folks that if you, if you are thinking that, that somehow Andrew Scheer is going to be different, I'm not sure on what you would be basing that. Um, all of the evidence would point you to say that a uh, sure government will be no different than a Harper government. I mean, look at the announcements they're making around the tax, uh, the transit tax credit and all of these other things. They're, they're the same policies. They're exactly the same policies. Right. So I, I think that's unfortunate. I would have hoped that the Conservative Party would have used the last four years to renew itself a little bit, to, mm -hmm. uh, to, to modernize itself on some of these issues like climate, like biodiversity loss. Um, like plastics. I mean, environmental issues are, are, is an area where I would actually like to see a more thoughtful Conservative Party. Yeah, I mean, uh, the word conserve is quite interesting that it's part of that, right? Yeah. And we need to be conservative about our actions, about what we are taking, conserve nature. And think about like fiscal responsibility. It's not responsible to invest in dying, uh, you know, fossil fuel uh, where we can be creating clean energy jobs. I think one of the th one of the things that I've seen recently, though, is that you know we're still continuing to give subsidies to you know six billion dollar subsidy to LNG Canada, uh, huge tax breaks. Why are we doing that? When we like, why can't we let this be a fair market where these you know renewables are competing against fossil fuels for what they are without our tax dollars going to these companies? Yeah, and I think that that's that is the objective. Um, again, I think can we stop it though? Well, can we just say we don't want to subsidize oil and gas anymore? We want yeah. a free, we want a situation where people succeed based on merit. Companies succeed based on merit and real uh, being competitive in global markets. Are there markets for this stuff? Does this make sense? And and I think that's a fair point. Uh, I would say a couple of things. The first is 
we probably all have to come to ground on what we mean by a subsidy. Um, sure. and, and there are okay. some who have incredibly broad definitions and there sure. are some who have incredibly narrow definitions. Right. Right. Um, there are some folks who say that, you know, providing the oil and gas uh, industry access to depreciation, which is an accounting treatment that every kind of company in Canada gets access to, is a subsidy. I would say that's probably not a subsidy. What we really talk, should be talking about are things that are dedicated for the oil and gas space. Mm -hmm. And in there, I mean, over the last uh, few years, there's nine different subsidies that have been eliminated. We've committed to eliminating all non, uh, all inefficient fossil fuel subsidies by 2025, mm -hmm. um, in line with Mexico, in line with some of the commitments that have been made by other G20 partners. And that's something that we are working to do. Right. Okay. Well, I wanted to ask then, I mean, we have uh, aggressive climate targets, you're telling me, right? Now... How is it that we are, you know, I think one of the biggest disappointments I can say from somebody who really, you know, living in, in uh, I grew up in West Vancouver, I now live in the city of North Vancouver. I'm looking at, you know, the ocean every day. Yep. Vancouver, we're surrounded by ocean. Yep. Kinder Morgan, how on earth do we buy a pipeline? I right. mean, from a Texas oil giant that was really trying to bulldoze indigenous people out of their way, do play every dirty trick with Harper to try to, you know, who had no consideration for the environment, really. And how, so how do we, what was the, I don't think people really know, I, I never, until this day, don't understand why we want to scale up when we really want to eventually scale down. Sure. Sure, and I think that's that's a completely legitimate question. Um, I mean, you you uh, you live in a riding of North Vancouver where this is a, an issue that people talk about quite a lot. Um, and, uh, and certainly lots of folks came to see me in my office about the concerns that they had about, uh, about Trans Mountain uh, before the decision and subsequent to the decision. Mm -hmm. And it's certainly an issue on which North Vancouverites are split. Um, when you poll in the riding, North Vancouverites are split. There's probably 55 to 60% in favor and 40 to 45% that are opposed. Um, but, but I think what you, you really think it's that, that uh, split? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, we've obviously done. But do they have the facts? Because I talk to people all the time, and they go, "Oh, we need pipelines because our gas prices are, you know, we need to lower our gas prices." I'm like, "We're shipping, you know, bitumen to overseas markets. We're not even processing it in Canada, so we can benefit." Yeah. You know? So, so it, maybe let, let's talk about different levels. So the the issues that that folks tend to raise when they have concerns and legitimate concerns are how does it fit with Canada's commitment to climate action yeah, absolutely. Um, and also how can you ensure that shipping in the harbor is done in a safe way. Mm -hmm. and, and I think those are both completely legitimate questions that people have and, and when I was in Ottawa before the decision was made, I made the case that in order for the government to approve the pipeline, we would have to have thoughtful and substantive responses to both of those. Mm -hmm. um, on the climate, and, and I know that there are folks that will disagree, but, uh, but on the climate piece, I would say a few things. The first is Canada incorporated all of the upstream emissions associated with the pipeline into the starting point for the Pan-Canadian framework. So we will achieve that, that Paris target with the emissions associated with the pipeline. So there's no inconsistency with being able to meet your target. Okay, but, like, but we're talking about like 300,000 barrels now, like yeah. capacity. Going up to eight hundred and ninety thousand, right? right? Let me, more let me, than double. Let me, let me say a couple of other yeah. things. I mean, the first is um, I think my view is people sort of get too focused on the pipeline. The pipeline is a transmission mechanism for oil, right? It's a mm -hmm. way to move oil. If you look at between the beginning of twenty sixteen and the end of 2015, uh, 2018, yeah, um, about two hundred and sixty thousand incremental barrels of oil were moving by rail. Mm -hmm. So they were moving by rail because there was no additional pipeline capacity. So mm -hmm. you're seeing oil coming out, mm -hmm. but it's coming out on the rail cars rather than on in a pipeline because the pipeline hasn't been built. So mm -hmm. folks that assume that simply because you're not building the pipeline, you're going to not have the oil coming out, I think that's just factually wrong. The other thing I would say is... Um, but why can't we downscale our oil production and try to, try but, to create... But so this is where I'm going. I mean, yeah. And I, I have great respect for people who take the position that you take, uh, and, and certainly I have enormous respect for people who are concerned about climate change. Mm -hmm. But I would say to you that you could, you could decide to, to stop oil production in Canada tomorrow entirely. Yeah, but and I'm not saying that. Have, and yeah. it would have no impact on climate change. Zero. How? Because 
at the end of the day, the issue is about demand for oil. It's about the use of oil. It's about reducing the demand for oil through our transportation fleet and through transportation fleets around the world. If you stopped oil production in Canada tomorrow, mm -hmm. it would simply be made up for by oil from Iran or Saudi Arabia or Venezuela. And, and it would continue on. So the focus, if you really care about climate change, the mm -hmm. focus has to be, how do you stop the use of oil? How do you actually transition over time to an electric vehicle fleet in Canada? Mm -hmm. And that, that's not just about getting electric cars, it's also about clean generation of energy because right. you don't help yourself if you're creating electricity from coal. But it's also about how do we get out and work with countries around the world, especially developing countries, to ensure that they are doing the same thing. Because ultimately, if you're gonna see a transition, what it means is that there's less demand for oil, and that's the area we should be focused on. Well, there you have it, the first 30 minutes of that interview. Jonathan is a busy man, and we're in the heat of an election right now, so I really appreciated being heard by him. I don't agree with every decision the government's made, that's for sure, I'm definitely against the pipelines. But it's a beautiful thing to be heard by somebody of that level of government, give me a chance to speak my mind, and. At least we have a government now and a minister that makes decisions based on science and listens to his constituents. That's a part of being Canadian and I'm proud to have a voice in this country. So get out the vote, make sure you vote and choose, you know, choose science, choose a government that respects science. That's all I ask of us.